Well, welcome back, everybody. You know, great leadership does not happen accidentally. It happens intentionally. And that's exactly why I titled today's podcast, The Chief Intentional Officer, featuring Brian Brown's CIO, Gray Nestor. I've known, learned from, and been inspired by Gray for the better part of the last couple of decades. You know, over those years, I've had the joy of watching Gray in different scenarios, different companies, different situations, different uh, companies even. But what has remained the same is a set of leadership principles, a set of leadership philosophies that really differentiate him, differentiate his teams, and allow them to show up uh, in a very special, very different way. And so, you know, I've been in this business almost 40 years. I'm a student of leadership, I'm a student of technology leaders. And what I find is the best of the best, like Gray, do not get distracted by the bright, shiny object. What we call in our profession, the shiny object syndrome. Rather, they are laser focused on a set of attributes, a set of a way of thinking, a way of showing up. I call it the seven C's of great leaders. And my goal today, with the help of some special friends, some mystery questioners, is to unpack those seven C's with Gray, those superpowers that make him a special leader. So this is long overdue. I'm so excited about it. We're in this beautiful facility. We'll talk about that here in a minute. So let's first uh, welcome in the man of the hour, which he's not gonna like me saying that, but I am anyways. So Greg, always good to be with you. Welcome. Welcome to Brown and Brown. Thanks, Thanks for coming down. Thank you. Now, people know who watch the show on YouTube realize we're not doing YouTube. We're in a very special place, a very special room. Tell us about this room we're in. So this is our club room and, you know, part of our unique culture is actually bringing people together. Mm -hmm. And so when we thought about the opportunity to uh, both bring in potential acquisitions as well as the opportunity to engage with teammates differently, we wanted spaces that allowed people to connect. And so... The vision of the team was to build a space like this to allow people to connect, to get connected to the culture, and to have a conversation. And so there's a lot of spaces in this building, this just being one of them, that don't actually center around technology because we believe it's teammates plus technology. Mm. Yeah, we'll talk more about that here in a minute. There's some, there's some people that really made this all possible. Great, I know you always are about... Uh, shine the light on those folks. So you want to say hello to some folks who help yeah, us Yeah, I do. Out? I, I want to, first of all, thank you and your team. You've been a great friend for a long time, a mentor and a coach, and I learn something every time we're together. But I also want to thank our great team here at Brown and & Brown. And so I want to start by thanking our awesome communications partner, Jenny Goko. We couldn't do what we do without you. And uh, as Dan said, this stuff sometimes makes me very uncomfortable, but Jenny uh, helps me remember why it's important and how it helps the team. And so thank you, Jenny. Uh, also a special thanks to Lori Insko, who without Lori, uh, my life would be a mess or a bigger mess than it already is if Lori's listening to this. And then in the other room, uh, we've got Terrence and Evan, who are our awesome team that help us uh, do this for Tech Whispers. But we do a number of these things around Brown and Brown, and we get an extremely high level of engagement because they're all done with quality. And without Terrence and Evan, that would never happen. And so it's uh, all the hard work today is amongst those four people and uh, your team. And so uh, I just happen to be the mouthpiece for the 850 people that show up every day and do technology work inside of Brown and Brown. Well, thank you all. I mean, it's definitely the A team here. And uh, I definitely want to talk about the people, the culture here, the culture here. I was spent the day here yesterday and it's just unique. You know, you see people together, you see people going out of their way to thank others for doing certain things. You see people that really care about each other. And so, uh, you know, thanks to Jenny, uh, we have some special guests today. We have some mystery questioners and we actually have a couple surprise questioners. So uh, I'm gonna welcome in the first one. So I'd like to welcome in your colleague and peer and friend, Julie Turpin. So Julie, Thanks Thank for you. coming by. So great welcome. to be here with you. Welcome. Thank Hello, you. Greg. Good to see you. You too. So Julie, um, I know you're running crazy, so thanks for making the time. My and, pleasure. Yeah. 
So in my introduction, I talked about how the great leaders focus on the seven C's of, of great leadership, right? They're not focused on the bright, shiny object, we, the shiny object syndrome, right? Yep. <laughs> and so two of those I'd love to help you, have you help me unpack. So one is around cultivate. So being the chief people officer, you're a business person first always, but chief people officer here. Kind of talk about with Gray about the people side of it, you know, knowing, growing, engaging, retaining, attracting, and you building the, the world-class team here. So t take it away, I'll let you take it with, with Gray. And I wanna come back and ask you a question about culture too. Okay, perfect. So Gray, I have a couple of questions for you awesome. that I'd love to go through with you. You have such a wonderful leadership style with your team. And so I think having our listeners understand maybe some of the tools and techniques and uh, ways in which you lead your team, I think will be really helpful and how that sort of fits into what I would call is our very special culture here. So my first question, question for you is organizations all over the world are focused on the recruitment and retention of the best and brightest talent. And Brown and Brown is clearly no exception. The war for talent and technology, as we both know, right, has become increasingly competitive um, in this digital age. And leaders must really look at how we engage, how we empower, and how we develop our teammates. How are you thinking about talent differently than you may have historically, starting with um, recruitment through onboarding and then long-term related to both uh, retention and development? It's a different world today, as you know, because you get to deal with all of our teammates and be an awesome business partner. So thank you for that. In our world, the, the um, battle for that talent is larger than it's ever been. And so it's interesting that we find a lot of people that are technically capable of delivering solutions, but they aren't a great fit inside of our culture. And so they get here and they're stuck. And we have to help them understand the importance of not just delivering a technology solution, but doing so in a way that aligns to what the business views success as. And so as we think about recruiting people, that really has shifted um, over the last several years for me is, how do I ensure that culture versus technical capability is the thing that we're testing for? Because um, not too long ago, the test had to be for, do you have the technical capability to do this thing that we're doing? And now uh, that people are more experienced, you have more people that have been in technology for careers and more businesses are doing new and interesting things. It's about, can you actually be successful inside of Brown and Brown? And the way I've had to change to answer your question specifically is, I've had to make talent development a full-time job. And so as I think about the leaders that have trusted us with their future, which is amazing, um, there's some people on the team that I talked to for three years before they joined the team. And so the ability to talk to somebody for three years and then have them be totally bought in and come to the team is really, really impactful. But we have to be cultivating that inside of Brown and Brown as well. So through the partnership with Crystal and your team, we really get the opportunity to build a program for everything from our interns all the way up to our most senior leaders to ensure that we're investing in our people so that they can be successful forever since we're a forever company. And so that's how I think about that. Thank you, Gray. I have a fun story, Dan, about Please. Gray. And so I call Gray our closer because we've had a couple of teammates who were, you know, they were thinking about joining our organization and we had them just about there. And then we handed them over to Gray and he was able to close the deal on a couple of them. And the way he did it was not extra cash. Mm. It was, or, or any form of compensation, it was really conveying to them the essence of our culture. And I think, you know, when you think about partnering with a leader like Ray, I think it's really important that that's what we lead with as an organization. I think, Ray, you do a wonderful job of doing that. So thank, thank you, you for that. And thanks for closing a couple of those deals for us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's fun. The closer. I like that. You know, I... 
I, I call this the chief intentional officer episode, Ooh, but I might like change it. it to the chief closer I officer. I like that too. <laughs> you know? We're a sales culture, so I think a, the chief closer would be a good idea. It. Well, we'll talk about the financial results here in a few minutes, which are pretty stellar, but let's talk about culture here because I mentioned it earlier, it's intentional, right? It starts at the top. Um, you can feel it here. I mean, it's just different. And as a CIO, I, I've not seen anybody do culture better than Gray. So, you know, Julie, maybe kind of just kind of tee up something around around the culture here. You know, maybe tee up a question with Gray. And also just maybe you mentioned the partnership. I think the chief people, chief information officer partnership is hugely important today. Thank you, Dan. Okay, Gray, you ready? I'm ready. My culture question for you is our unique company culture is paramount, as you know, at Brown & Brown, and you're definitely a culture carrier. So, um, And that's meritocracy, honesty, integrity, and dedication to health and well-being, supporting our communities, and so much more. So how do you infuse your everyday interactions with your team with those of the fundamental cultural tenets that include our culture? in technology solutions? So the biggest thing for me is challenging people to always do what's right. And that's not always doing what's easy. And it's interesting, you know, we're in a very important time of year here where we're reviewing talent with our team. And I was talking to one of our senior leaders the other day on the technology team. And I said, so how are you doing? And his answer was, I'm doing really well. I finally figured out what you mean by always do what's right. And so in so many worlds today, and you know this, there are checkers checking the checkers, checking the checkers, and the culture really is, I will need to control your decision. But here at Brown & Brown, when you think about our meritocracy, honesty, and integrity, what really relates to that is we're going to hire really smart people and then we're going to enable them to do what they do. And so we need them to be able to make a decision. And as we find so often, we get people at our level that are going to be our direct reports and they've never actually been empowered to make a decision. And so I think that's magical sort of inside of uh, keeping pace with change that's happening in the world today, if all the decisions have to flow through one or two talented people, you're in trouble. And so for me, if I can just people get people that know what the right thing is and empower them to do the right thing, then I can go to the golf course and play a lot of golf. How about that? <laughs> I like it. You know, uh, one of the ways that Greg communicates very well is through technoculture, mm -hmm. which we'll talk a little bit about that later and kind of a, on all hands, but it's got a very special style to it. And I watched the last technoculture, which you were the guest of, you were featured. I was. And, and I was a little, I was like, did he really ask her that question? So <laughs> what was the question he asked you? And then maybe speak to the partnership that you two have and why that's so important to the company. Sure. Well, Gray asked me a number of questions, but I think the one you're talking about is about what products I use. That's the one. <laughs> right on. And just cool so hair. for those cool of hair. you who maybe don't understand, he meant hair products. And uh, naturally, that's not the first time anyone's ever asked me that. That happens to me on a weekly basis, but it was pretty funny. So, yeah. <laughs> and Gray already knows my products because, you know, when we travel, people ask me. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> Too funny. Too funny. So happy to talk about the culture here. I've been with the organization coming on 12 years. And I think personally, one of the things I love about our culture is you can be who you are, right? And so you need to be disciplined. You certainly need to have honesty, integrity, but you got to make decisions. You get to grow. You get to explore. You get to pilot new things. I think we work so well together. We have a very collaborative environment. Going back to what um, Gray said, we have the ability to make decisions here and we're a pretty large organization. So the ability to make decisions at every level is very powerful because it allows us to be exceptionally agile. 
Um, I think some of the other things that are very important to us in our culture is we genuinely care about each other. And so that's so important because we care about mental health of our teammates. And so if we think, if I think Ray's not having a good day, I'll stop and take the time to see if there's some way I can help them. And we've got lots of ways that we help our teammates, but that is a priority for us. Mental health, brain health is an absolute priority for us. And I think, you know, a lot of companies are sort of coming up to speed and thinking that's important. We've thought that that's important for a very long time. And we make investments in that to demonstrate the level of importance on that. We talk about it openly. And I think the thing, the other thing I really love about our culture is we're so entrepreneurial. We have that spirit. So if you need to be told what to do and you can't figure it out, it's not going to work for you here, right? And we have the ability, I think our culture is so strong and it's so special and we're so connected that we have the ability to sort of, you know, if, so, if you don't fit in the culture, it becomes clear very quickly. And we help you, you know, find another bus to get on. We exit you in a way that's very thoughtful. Um, and I think we, we apply a very thoughtful approach. So, um, so I think our culture is special. I think the decentralized service uh, sales model is very important for us as an organization and honoring that. And then creating infrastructure where it makes sense at the enterprise level, which is what Gray and I do for our leaders at the local level to help them in the areas that they're not experts at. And I think we've figured out a magical way in which to deliver that. So, One of the things that you and I always talk about with, with Julie is how she's a business person first, mm -hmm. like you are. And, you know, these things aren't only for people which is the right reason, but it's also business. I mean, you're a business person. Correct. You know that this impacts. And uh, we're about to have another surprise guest in a minute, Gray, that we're gonna talk a little bit about your recent earnings and how that's all going. Awesome. So, well, we're very excited about it. We yeah, are. Yeah, you should be. But Julie, thanks so much for coming by. Pleasure, really Dan. special, good to spend time with you. And uh, I know you got a full, full schedule, so I'll let you keep running. Thank you. What a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Thank you Julie. both. Yeah. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. Thank All you, right. Dan. Be well. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. you. Yeah, so that was pretty special with Julie. Yeah, yeah absolutely. She was really, really excited about being here and honoring you in that way. And one of the great things about being on site is we get to have another surprise guest. So I'd like to welcome in, uh, tell us who Powell Brown is in the company. Yeah, so Powell's our CEO. He's been in this business for a long time. Um, and, uh, the unique part about this business is, well, it's a family business um, that happens to be publicly traded. Uh, our chairman, Hyatt, might be harder on uh, the two boys that are in the business than he is on me as an outsider. And so uh, it's an honor to work with somebody who's as thoughtful and intelligent, but also connected to the business as Powell. Yeah. And uh, he's a great business partner, but he's also a friend. Yeah. Well, Powell, thank you so much for coming by. Thank you, hey, bud. How are you? Nice to see you. Good to see you. I know you hey, got a pretty intense schedule, yeah. so thanks so yeah, much. Yeah. Happy yeah. to be here. Uh, I did uh, last week listen in on earnings call. Congratulations. Thank you very much. We we're very pleased with the performance in Q4 and our year. Yep. Yeah. You, you want to just give a couple of highlights? I mean, it was just, I mean, just the numbers were just staggering. Sure. I mean, I mean, I don't think a quarter makes a trend. So I would preface that. We had a really good quarter. We grew 7.7%. Uh, we write a, wrote a lot of new business. We expanded our capabilities through several acquisitions. We did a lot of things, but I kind of think about it in year and multi-year chunks. And so last year we grew the, grew the business organically over 10%. So it's over 10%. We crossed our intermediate goal of $4 billion in revenue. We set that goal five years ago. So we went from two to four. We've set a new inter intermediate goal, which is now eight. So we'll have a mantra internally straight to eight. And um, most importantly, it's all about teammates. So numbers don't drive results. People through significant relationships with teammates and customers and carrier partners drive those results. So we talk a lot about long-term relationships in our business um, and how we're preparing for that. And so technology, as an example, is an integral part of the next step for us to get to the next level and the next level and the next level. And so it's all interrelated, but we're really, thanks for saying that, but we're really pleased with our performance and now we start again. Yeah, yep. Did such a good job, we get to do it all over again. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, you're always talking about 
teammates, you're talking about the power of we, you're talking about customers all the time. And so you just feel that in the, in the culture here. But I want to kind of have, have you maybe unpack part of uh, Gray's story from your perspective. You have, a, you have a question or two for him? I do. I have all kinds of questions. <laughs> so, but uh, I wrote one down. Awesome. So I wanted to uh, start with this. We've seen the roles of CIOs and technology teams evolve in recent years. And technology plays a critical role in business strategy and long-term planning and as a driver of success. We at Brown & Brown, you know, we're a large multinational organization with a decentralized operating model. That brings opportunity, but it also brings complexity. This uh, also, there's also a need to balance operational technology infrastructure with innovative new technology that helps us improve customer and teammate experiences. So can you share how you think about IT strategy and the creation of a clearly defined roadmap for all the moving parts and pieces in our organization? And how do you identify and prioritize investments that need to be made on a never ending, transforming technology journey? Yeah, I think that's really insightful, right? Because the magic is being an operator and being in the business every single day because if you think about the way technology's changed, that used to be a back office function that really um, delivered some operations, but didn't actually help the business with performance. And as you think about where we are today, so much of what we do, so much of our lives has technology laced all throughout it. And so for us to have the right business strategy, then our technology strategy has to be aligned to that. And if we have people who don't understand the business and aren't spending time with our business leaders, then we'll find those things are bifurcated because there are definitely a lot of technology leaders out there that like the shiny object syndrome that you talked about in sort of the introduction. And that shiny object syndrome doesn't actually equate to results. So as I think about what our roadmap really needs to be, it needs to mirror our business strategy roadmap. But inside of that, as an operator and an owner of Brown & Brown, it's important that I'm pushing to ensure that we also have the right alignment on the business strategy. And I find that um, impactful in many of our sessions that we have together on a weekly basis to say, I'm thinking about how do we become more effective with this in the business? And these are some ideas on how technology may enable that. You know, I know you referenced this, uh, and I know this is not, I think, common, but it's, it is the case here. So Gray and I work directly together, and we've done that for several years. And we have a meeting once a week, a minimum, just to talk about our items for at least an hour. And that's usually an unstructured meeting, which means I can come in with three or four things that I've been thinking about, read, heard about. I was in a meeting, somebody raised an issue, I didn't understand, whatever the case may be. And then he's talking to me about things that not only I need to know in terms of just day-to-day -day business execution, but how do we think forward? And so what I would say from my standpoint, I'm kind of curious by nature, but Gray has helped me sort of unlock the curiosity around technology. That does not mean that I can set the strategy. I cannot set the technology strategy, but I can enable it and we can fund what we think is very important because we're on this multi-year journey. I call it like a forever journey. We're in a marathon run. And so, I just think that's normal. And the more I hear, it's not that normal. So I say that because um, Gray is one on the operating committee of the company. So he's a business partner. He's not just viewed as a technology person because he understands the insurance business and understands how to get and keep customers. That's a unique combo. Number two, we work directly together. That's the part that I just thought was no big deal. It's not as common. You could tell me more about it than I can tell you. And then three, 
we have this kind of free flowing kind of thing where I may call him and say, did you see this hack? And he said, well, I saw it two days ago. And I might say, well, this is the business that they were in. And that might have some correlation in some place to a business that we own. Not that we've been hacked on that type of business, but I'm saying that might. So it's a really interesting kind of dynamic. So it is. Yeah, I've really had a chance to see your collaboration. Uh, we've had lunch together. We've, uh, we, I had the honor of joining you for Technoculture about a year ago. One of the things that really struck me was, I don't know if you did this intentionally, but you don't have to tell me, but I couldn't tell in that meeting which, with, which of you was the business executive and which one was the digital executive. Because Paolo, you, I mean, you're a very forward-leaning, digital, technology-savvy, curious person. Uh, Gray, obviously, you know, obviously business, business first as well. So I don't know, I think that's pretty special along with your partnership. Yeah, I, I, I consider myself to be very blessed, as you know, and, and to have a business partner like Powell, just this morning he called me because he had gotten a call from one of our operators out in the business and the operator was questioning how we show up around filtering email. And for those people listening or watching that don't really understand our business, email is the cash register. And so I can make the cash register take less money, less fake money, but we're going to take less real money as well. And so Powell and I have spent a lot of time talking about sort of, do we care about the fish or do we care about the result of the fish and how tight do we want email controls? Because that's a careful balance inside of every company, but when email is your cash register, it's a really careful balance. And so this morning he got a call from one of our business partners who said, we've got to stop this. And he goes, well, listen, and he explains exactly how it works to that person. And I'm like, I've got the best job in the world because when Powell, our CEO can stand up for the right things and actually say, hey, we're thinking about your business and the impact it would have on your business as we roll out controls. Um, we've not arrived, but it certainly makes getting there a lot easier. Well, one of the big, bold visions of the company, Powell, I'd love to have you talk about this. And I'll preface it by saying half of the Fortune 500 has disappeared since 2000. So that, that's quite a bold statement. But here, you alluded to earlier, we are the forever company. What does that mean? And, and Gray, how does that, how do you enable that as a technology solutions team? So we will celebrate our 85th anniversary this year. And so it's something that we're really proud about. Uh, and, uh, and, and I try to think of it not in quarterly increments or even in annual increments. We typically talk three and five and 10 and 15 years down the, the you know, road. That's number one. Um, fundamentally, we think teammates first. So we got to have the right teammates to interface with the customers and keep to ant the ones we have and then get new ones. We also have what I call a decentralized sales and service model. That's very important because the way that people are successful in Syracuse, New York, and Seattle, Washington, and Sarasota, Florida, and then Fort Lauderdale might all be a little different, but they all can be very high performing offices when we operate under certain core values like honesty and integrity and all these other type of things that are just foundational core values at Brown and Brown. The other thing that I think helps us is um, unlike many large public companies, we have a very significant internal ownership. So 22% of the company is owned by teammates. Mm. So that's really important. So when I go into an office and the director of first impressions says, hi, Powell, that's the receptionist. Some people use that term. I don't use that term. They say, how you doing? What's up with the stock? I know she or he owns shares. Mm. And so we have a huge number of teammates that own shares in the company. 
And one of our sort of core themes is wealth creation for all teammates, okay? So we want people to get a piece of the rock. You can buy it at a discount, you can be granted it in some instances, there are all these different ways. But the answer is, we want everybody to feel like an owner, and they are, okay? And as a result of having 22% uh, internal ownership, we don't manage quarter to quarter. So we don't do things that are short-term in nature. We're thinking way down the road. And so a lot of public companies just think we got to make this first quarter. And the answer is, you know, if we make the estimates of the uh, analysts or we don't, I'm not worried one way or the other. I would like to make it, but I just want to grow our business and grow it profitably. And so it's all about how we get better as we get bigger, but act smaller. Because we also think big companies sometimes have a tendency where people will think, well, that's not my job. Well, the answer is, I'll do any job in the company that I need to do. Now, I may not be a technology expert, but if Gray says we've got something going on and we're, you could help, then all of a sudden I'll go get involved and somebody might say, well, why were you doing that? And the answer is number one, they needed the help. And number two, it shows people that I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. And so not only will I, that's my expectation of everybody else. And so we have this culture which sort of gets stuff done, like just do it, you know, and, and technology helps us enable that. And the interesting thing is where Gray and the team and technology are taking our data and using that to the benefit of one, our teammates to make better decisions and give better solutions and proposals to our customers and prospects. And so as you think about delivering that, right, I would say um, there's three reasons why I have a high level of confidence that we aren't gonna be one of the half that didn't make it. The first is um, we have a belief the only constant is change. And so, it's not something that we say and don't do. It's something that we are talking about and implementing every single day, and we continue to look for ways to be better. The second thing inside of that with the ownership culture is our people are highly aligned to the future success of this business, and therefore, you don't have a lot of people making decisions with other people's money. And so my experience working inside of some very large companies is that sometimes people treat money as if it's other people's money and not their own money. And that doesn't happen very often here. That goes back to what we were talking about with Julie, that opportunity to always do what's right. And then the third thing that I think makes us extremely unique is through that decentralized sales and service culture, we have innovation at all levels of the business. So not necessarily some big innovation office with the innovation czar who's out there doing this to our teammates, but it might be three people in Rome, Georgia going, hey, I think I found a better way to solve this problem. So when we're at our annual sales meeting at the end of the month, there'll be a guy on stage who Powell thinks a lot of, I think a lot of, he's in South Florida and he insures crops and bees. And this guy is constantly thinking about new and innovative ways to solve solutions for farmers. And one of the most humble guys you've ever met in your life has had success beyond anything he's ever imagined in his life. But the reality of life is he's still hungry because he hasn't arrived. And my goal is to ensure that our team understands that while we've had a tremendous amount of success and I'm super pleased with our results, both financially and from a technology perspective, there's a lot of work to be done. Right, right. Well, Powell, thanks so much for coming by. I know you're running hard. Global company, great success. 85 years, congratulations on that. And uh, I'll see you at Technoculture Live, yeah. I hope, and, I look in forward Dallas. to it. Yeah. Awesome. I'll be there. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming to join us. Yep. Thanks, sir. Nice to see you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right. See you next yeah. time. All Absolutely. right. Absolutely. Uh, so fun. I mean, it's just what a what an amazing team.
right here and uh, the leadership, you just starts at the top. Yesterday we were in the cafeteria, you know, Powell's coming down, just mixing okay. it up and Hyatt's there sitting, chatting with people. It's really, really special. So, you know, I want to pivot to another one of our mystery questioners now. Okay. All right. So if we can tune that up, uh, we'll, we'll jump in and tell us who this is when we come back. All right. Hey, Gray, in all the years we work together, you seem to always have a unique ability to anticipate the next problem that was coming or the next new technology that was coming long before it got there and before a lot of times before other people anticipated it. To what do you attribute that almost crystal ball-like ability that you have? Well, Dan, that's uh, Jeff Dry. And... uh... Jeff and I had the pleasure of working together for all of my years at bb and And honestly, without Jeff, I would have never made it as long as I did at bb and So he was there when I got there and he was uh, kind and welcoming and accepting. And the only problem I really ever had with Jeff in the 17 years I spent at bb and was occasionally with that thick Statesville, North Carolina accent. I couldn't tell what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. So, Jeff, thank you for your time. Actually, I was, I was texting with Jeff this morning because I went to a local provider here in uh, – Volusia County to get some things for the house and they had an antique tractor calendar on their desk and Jeff is a big tractor fan so it made me think of him this morning and uh, he's a great friend. Uh, Jeff's too kind. I think I think that uh, um, the, the, the thing that we have to do as we look at the future is we have to ensure that that we're paying attention and that we're being curious. And so I find that the team that we have is really good at planning for perfection. And inside of that, they're planning for things to go well. And I think my uh, superpower and sort of seeing around the corner and being able to anticipate the future is I start by number one, being curious, but I also start by asking what could go wrong and how do we prepare for those things that go wrong? And it becomes a whole lot easier to deal with those challenges uh, when you've uh, tabletop some of the scenarios that may happen in the middle of this. And so I don't know that... um, I don't know that I've ever really done much besides taking time every year to sit down and really think about how's the business changed over the last 10 years and what do I think is going to happen in the next 10 years and how might some of those things accelerate or decelerate. And so uh, Jeff was a really important part about that for me because he was a great business partner and, uh, and I, that dude's got a special place in my heart. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Hope you enjoy that calendar. Um, got another one from your, your past. Okay. So uh, let's tune up another mystery questioner. And again, uh, unpack more of the secret sauce of Gray Nestor and the chief intentional officer. So check it out. Gray, my question for you is how do you teach IT staff to better understand the business and how best to communicate with your business partners in order to drive the most IT value for them? Well, that's a great uh, mentor and coach of mine, Will Shoup, and I had the pleasure of working for Will for at least half of the years that I was at the bank. I think uh, he was my leader for 10 years, and uh, Will probably helped me more in that question than he would take credit for. And So I'm happy for him and his wife, Cheryl, who are retired here now, Florida residents. Um, And uh, and so, you know, inside of this, uh, while asking the hard questions and looking for what might go wrong might be my superpower, uh, the kryptonite is communication, right? (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, And so I mentioned earlier, uh, my friend Jenny Goko, who helps us here at uh, 
brown and brown, but we had people that have helped over the years. And I think as technology people, we have a hard time sort of believing that if we need to communicate something to you, we'll tell you. And short of that, if you haven't heard from us, it's all okay. And boy, is that wrong. And so the challenge for the team here at Brown and Brown and the challenge for all of you listening to this, wherever you are in your career is, how do you take the technology that you're working on and actually focus on the business outcomes you're trying to drive? Because so often we want to communicate in tech speak or even worse, not communicate. And we get frustrated because the business is not accepting of the change that we want to enable. And we see the value in the change, but we don't know how to articulate the business outcome that's going to come from the change. And then I think as you go to that next step, and this is where we are in our journey here at Brown and Brown, then it really gets into what are the key performance indicators that you're tracking to ensure that you're going to achieve the business outcome that you committed to? And as you work inside of a business like Brown and Brown, highly acquisitive business, Powell talked about our organic growth, but our inorganic growth is also impressive and number of acquisitions 30 plus last year. And that's sort of a running rate, right? So it's not like that's a one year uh, magical thing that happens. The, Inside of that, this is a fast changing business, but we have to decide, do we do this technology project? Do we do this acquisition? Do we hire this set of people? Do we buy this book of business that may not be an acquisition? And so each of these investments have competing priorities and have different outcomes. And if you aren't able to articulate the outcomes that you plan on driving with the investment, then you shouldn't be surprised that you aren't getting your fair share of investment. And so, uh, Will, thank you for your time. Uh, we've got to get together and play golf, but, um, but he had a lot to do with that through his leadership uh, at many different places, but particularly what he did at Home Depot and then inside of the bank. He taught me a lot about how to be a better business communicator. Definitely our Achilles in this profession, and those who 100%. do it well really stand out. And it's something that uh, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's something we can all definitely improve on. And the other side of that, and by the way, communication is one of the seven C's, so no, no surprises yeah, there. One of the things you're very intentional about as the chief intentional officer, because the flip side of communication is listening, and you've got a great grayism around, around that. We all are very excited to say what we want to say, and we show up. And we're afraid we're going to forget what it is we want to say. And so the challenge for the technology solutions team, but it's interesting, Powell has adopted this and it's really become the Brown and Brown challenge is, are you listening to respond or are you listening to understand? And so while that sounds easy, it's really hard. And I got to tell you, some days I win at it and some days I lose at it, right? Because it's a constant journey of how fast you're going, how engaged you are in the conversation, um, what you have going on in your personal life and how that might be distracting you from being successful in your work life. And so are you giving it the time that it needs? And sometimes I have to check myself and just say, right now is not the right time, or I'm sorry, I haven't given you what you need. And I know all the, all the power coaching says, don't say you're sorry, say you're freaking sorry. It's okay. It's okay to be sorry about it. And it's also okay um, to say, I'm not prepared to have this conversation right now, but I'm committed to have this conversation at a time when I'm ready. And I can be ready tomorrow, next week, next month. And the more you're willing to do that with your business partners, the more they're willing to do that with you. Right. And that actually diffuses a lot of the emotions that comes out of those places where we may have missed expectations or not communicated effectively. Yeah. This is all part of your, uh, your just genuine humility and 
it, it, it shows up in other ways too. I see it and um, kind of taking a page from Satya Nadella, you're very much a learn it all CIO, not a know it all CIO. Uh, I've seen you in action where you are very intentional about seeking, genuinely seeking the input of a, of a group of people before you make a decision. So maybe kind of talk about that part of your leadership style. Well, I think a lot of that goes to understanding the difference between what's urgent and what's important. And a lot of, um, a lot of people that I've had the pleasure of working with in the past struggle with the difference in what's urgent and what's important. And by the way, there's a third struggle in there, Dan, which you know very well, which is the ability to say no or not right now in a graceful way. And so as I think about uh, our ability to really drive a significant impact and to learn from the team, there are times when I have to make a decision. At the end of the day, I'm ultimately accountable for this. And don't try not to use the word I very often, but if we need to make a decision, we can do that. So we can't be paralyzed by perfection and we can't always seek everybody's opinion. But knowing the difference between what's urgent and what's important allows you the opportunity on important items to get feedback from people who may have seen things differently than you have or may have different thoughts than you. And so that creates buy-in. It also creates alignment and it creates a connection, right? Right, Because that collaboration, another C, inside of how we lead and how we show up every day really allows us to say, you're important to me. And when I find that we aren't being successful with somebody on the team, it often has to do with the question of how am I important? And so um, I can't thank all of my network enough who has contributed to this. I can't thank you enough for coaching and mentoring over 20 plus years. But yes, I'm going to get on the phone. I'm going to call a lot of people. I have a lot of questions. I'm going to ask lots of questions. Sometimes people are not sure how to take those questions um, because they feel like I'm challenging. But in reality, I just really want to understand what it is that we're doing so that I can be more supportive, so that I can tell our business partners when they challenge me about that investment, what outcomes we're gonna drive through that. It's powerful, the, the outcomes of that, I've, just, I've, I've seen it in action with you in many different environments. And you know, one of the things that we've really connected on over the years is uh, our shared passion for investing in people, yeah. developing people, you, you do it uh, in so, so, so many ways here. Again, the chief intentional officer, and, you know, one of the things that we're so excited about with this podcast is our Tech for Good, our, you know, giving the, giving the, uh, these scholarships to nonprofits, you know, $150,000 a year. And so, you know, uh, yeah. you got the opportunity to gift a seat in this program. You've got at Brown and Brown, a lot of organizations that you support locally, nationally, but uh, to someone that comes to mind who you think could really leverage this Tech LX program for their organization. There is. And first of all, I want to thank you for the Tech LX program. We have, I believe, 24 graduates inside of Brown and Brown in that Amazing. program and the next cohort's getting ready to kick off. And I know that our leadership team has already submitted who that is. And every day I can see differences in our leadership team through the gift that you give them of helping them be more intentional in their story and how they market themselves as a business person. So thank you for that. Mm. Also, thank you between you and our friend, Art Hopkins. Uh, I've become connected to an organization that's helping us significantly from a diversity perspective uh, called IT Senior Management Forum or ITSMF. And uh, the team there is doing amazing things with black technology leaders 
and helping them be more successful and uh, be better prepared for leadership roles when they become available. And so um, I'd like to, uh, if it's okay, give that scholarship to ITSMF, but I'd also like to, if it's okay, match that scholarship from Brown and Brown so that we can send two people through that program and help them better achieve their goals and objectives. That is phenomenal. That's a first on Tech Whispers. And, you know, it warms my heart because the ITSMF is very close to me. It's uh, as uh, inside we call it, it's, it's really stands for it's my family. And so glad you're part of the family. Glad Art, you know, was, yeah. uh, was part of that journey. I know you're going to be involved with uh, upcoming symposium, bring, right. a, bring a team of folks there. So, uh, but that's, th thank you so much for that. That is, that's outstanding. Powell often encourages us to get comfortable being uncomfortable and in a business that is doubled in five years and being in this role. That's an everyday occurrence, but I would encourage all of the people watching or listening today, um, no matter how you show up every day or what you look like, uh, Symposium One is coming up in a couple of months inside of Atlanta. And I had the pleasure of attending at Symposium Two uh, in Austin, Texas last year. And I learned a lot. And I would encourage uh, all of your leadership team to look into this and to get involved. Love it. Love it. Speaking of being uncomfortable, I'm going to get a little personal, if you don't mind. Sure. So this is the part that you probably were, were hoping I wouldn't do, but I'm going to do it anyways. And, you know, uh, one of my favorite gray expressions when I check in, see how you're doing, it's usually, I'm blessed beyond what I deserve. And it's usually followed up by something about Molly, special lady in your life. Yeah. Amazing uh, person. Amazing person, your wife. And... Uh, you know, something I learned about you, uh, there used to be, a, there was a book, and I think it was a movie called Tuesdays with Maury. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And this guy, young guy spent this time with this older gentleman. Well, there's a Saturdays with the nesters, <laughs> or maybe it's Saturdays with the widows. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us what you and Molly do on every Saturday night. Oh, uh, we have two amazing friends and neighbors uh, who both tragically lost their husbands uh, in the last 18 months. And so every Saturday night, Miss BJ and Miss Pat show up at our house at about six o'clock for dinner. And, uh, we call it our Saturday night supper club. And so, uh, BJ and Pat's, uh, family both live outside of the area. And, uh, if my mom was on a street, I'd want somebody to help her. And so, going back to always doing what's right. It's a pretty easy thing, but Miss BJ and Miss Pat will show up at our house and they'll belly up to the bar about six o'clock and they'll be ready for me to fix them a drink. So Miss BJ gets a glass of whiskey and Miss Pat gets a glass of white wine. And then I'm in the throes of cooking dinner. Or occasionally Molly's in the throes of cooking dinner and we always make sure that we send them home with a doggy bag. And it's so funny because we'll get a text or a call later in the week from one or both of them just saying, hey, we just got back together and we had another dinner provided by you guys. So such a blessing they are in our lives, you know, to, to spend time. BJ's 84 uh, and Pat is 76. And so to spend time with these ladies and learn from their wisdom and uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm blessed every time they spend time with us. And so I am blessed beyond anything that I ever deserve. And you mentioned Molly and, um, it wouldn't be right to thank all the people that we thank today without thanking Molly. I can't do this without an amazing person behind me who helps make all of this possible. And, uh, and you talk about humility and I know you had the opportunity to have dinner with Molly last night and thank you for your time, but she shows up as the most humble person in the world and she couldn't be more proud of me. And she doesn't really understand all the fingerprints on our success mm -hmm. that are hers. Yeah. Yeah. Special. Yeah. Well, I'm excited for both of you. I know those two, uh, those two ladies in the street look forward to that every week <laughs> and, uh, we do too. Really special. Thank you.
Um, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, we only got through four of the seven C's. So thank you for spending some more time. We'll do this blog and we'll get into customer courage and change so we can finish the cycle. Yeah. So a week from now, everyone look at co.com. But Gary, thank you for, for hosting us um, here. Be just beautiful facility. Thank you to your team and uh, appreciate your friendship. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. You've been listening to Tech Whispers, inside the playbook of the best digital leaders, a Woolet and Associates podcast. Keep connected with us by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you like what you've heard, please rate the show as this helps us connect the world's best digital leaders with those who aspire to learn, grow, and thrive in this amazing profession. Thanks for listening. Until next time.